Welcome, I'm Nathaniel Osgood, Director of the Computational Epidemiology and Public Health Informatics Lab at the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, I'm going to be presenting today a, a glimpse of some of our dynamic models to assist in strategic and operational planning and day-to-day -day guidance to help inform the prevention and the control of COVID-19 within our province. We're going to be spending the bulk of the hour going through um, uh, model types that uh, are consistent with the, um, the panel associated with this presentation in that they focus on hybrid dynamic models, which lie at the heart of our modeling strategy for addressing the challenges of COVID-19 in our province. I should note before beginning that this work would not have been possible without the extraordinary assistance of our lab's uh, uh, many excellent graduate students, including those uh, listed here. I want to single out Yuan Tian, Wade McDonald, Winshil Chen, uh, Yang Chen, Liu Jie Juan, and, and, uh, Doc, and Xiao Yan Li for their uh, uh, fundamental enablement of many of the lines of work here, as well as Dr. Kurt Kruger, a, a recent uh, graduate from our lab um, and one of those who's most centrally helped uh, shape the evolution of the modeling. I also want to provide my most sincere thanks to the Saskatchewan Health Authority um, in a partnership um, that has shaped this work uh, from uh, its beginning and um, that has allowed it to achieve uh, its full potential. So within today's talk, I'm going to be uh, providing an overview of um, the context of this work uh, and particularly highlighting uh, some of the roles in which uh, hybrid modeling uh, plays a role uh, throughout the, uh, the different projects. I'm then going to go in to talk about three vignettes associated with uh, hybrid modeling, um, which illustrate different uses of dynamic modeling uh, to aid in the prevention and control of uh, COVID-19 within our province. Uh, vignette one focuses on uh, use of models for capacity planning, but also supports some more detailed um, uh, types of analysis, uh, particularly with respect to uh, fine-grained characterization of the acute care flows. Vignette two uh, brings together a different combination of hybrid modeling. Um, uh, rather than being confined to uh, combinations of dynamic modeling techniques themselves, uh, it combines dynamic modeling technique of system dynamics or compartmental modeling with machine learning and, and big data um, to allow for uh, a, a model, a dynamic model that's constantly regrounded in new evidence in a very fast moving um, uh, type of pandemic uh, that allows for daily status updates, uh, short term projections, and critically, um, what if scenario evaluations to help us figure out, given the current situation and the best evidence um, for, for where we're at, what sort of um, a policy enactments or policy portfolios would be most effective bending the curve um, over the next uh, few weeks and months? Vignette three um, uh, harks back to combinations of dynamic modeling technique but, but does so to focus at a more detailed level than the previous two uh, scenarios. And really looking at a fine-grained way, a very granular way at um, evaluation of, of policy, port, policy portfolios. Um, and the model involved has a, a very diverse repertoire um, of, of different uh, policy portfolios that can be compared and contrasted to their um, many trade-offs. And finally, I'll be um, uh, ending with some um, concluding remarks. So the context of, th of this work lies, in, as I had noted, in um, CEPHAL, or Computational Epidemiology Public Health Informatics Lab's COVID-19 um, uh, program of work um, conducted jointly with our health authority and through the leadership of Dr. Jenny Bazran, Senior Information Officer there. Um, this involves this work involves dynamic modeling as a central component, but is more broadly part of a advanced analytics uh, uh, program of work um, that uh, crosslinks such models with uh, rich data sources such as uh, data from social media or from uh, healthline mining, uh, mining 
um, so mining from um, call data, for example, and from uh, soon from smartphone-based data collection. Now, this work is um, purposefully uh, centered around addressing key partner needs within our health authority, within our uh, public health and acute areas, acute care areas of that, but also within the uh, the Ministry of Health, um, and a set of. Uh, Partner needs emerged very early on in this work, um, including uh, anticipating um, the possible set of acute care needs for capacity planning purposes that need to be mobilized to confront the challenges of, uh, of COVID-19, uh, whether it's uh, surge capacity on the human resources side or the availability of extra space to treat COVID-specific patients. Um, they needed to know something about uh, the uh, the level of demand that might be called upon for them um, in, in somewhat of a, of a worst case analysis. A second need related to really assessing the current situation. Where are we at? Um, uh, are we at a situation where we're anywhere near herd immunity being attained? Um, uh, how many undiagnosed infected people are there likely out there? Um, what's the effective reproductive number, the number of people infected by a given infected before they recover right now? Um, uh, there's also a need to accompany that understanding with short-term projections and, and understanding um, the effects of, of interventions in place now um, as to how bad could things might have been without those interventions. And finally, there's a need to engage in very detailed prescriptive analysis for uh, intervention portfolios to, to understand how to best relax the, uh, the series of interventions that uh, our work help, um, help stimulate, but also um, uh, how to undertake new interventions um, in the dance phase of this. Um, uh, harking back to uh, uh, Stanford professor Apoyo's work um, on the, uh, the hammer and the dance. Um, the dance phase involves really a fine-grained understanding of where things are succeeding and where they're failing and being able to adjust the pol policy portfolio to reflect um, the need to ramp up um, protection in certain areas and ramp it back in other areas to allow for, for um, expansions of um, uh, economic activity where possible and to allow uh, families to, to come together more readily, et cetera. Um, so to address these challenges um, within our lab, we've made uh, we've made use of five or six uh, different models. I've I've listed them here because many of, of them are are central to this presentation. I'm not going to dwell on this, except to emphasize um, that this list accords with our uh, conviction, nay, our our experience over decades, that um, to address uh, these sort of needs requires different sorts of models for different sorts of questions and different sorts of modeling approaches are needed to address those different sorts of questions. And as we'll see, some of the most powerful types of approaches are those that weave together multiple lines of different modeling approaches. Um, responsive to that, uh, uh, as we'll see within these presentations, we've made um, heavy use thus far in combinations of, of uh, four different uh, modeling approaches um, listed here. Um, and a given hybrid approach, as we'll be going through with the three vignettes, um, combines together uh, multiples of these approaches. Why do we engage in this sort of hybrid modeling? Well, um, I, I only address this in this presentation because of the, the topic associated with the panel. Um, but the truth is hybrid modeling is, in my view, one of the uh, key methodological uh, uh, resources we can, um, we can draw on for our projects. Uh, it allows nimbleness of modeling and adaptivity as our understanding of where the model needs uh, uh, need to be deepened or, or made in, in return a more efficient evolve we can respond by uh, crafting different areas of our models using different uh, approaches. For example, uh, compartmental or uh, aggregate system dynamics models for areas which are of less focal interest and in agent-based or discrete event simulation for those of, of more fine-grained interest. We can also secure um, the, the very uh, substantive uh, comparative advantages of certain approach for certain questions. Um, 
And uh, for those who engage uh, substantively in multiple types of modeling, it is beyond question that each of the major approaches, whether it's system dynamics modeling, uh, discrete event simulation, uh, or agent-based modeling, or in turn, machine learning, each have their areas of extraordinary advantage. And we can tap into that. Um, we can also make use of methods that appeal to um, and, and uh, build confidence in stakeholders that, that can allow them to more easily relate their, their explicit and tacit knowledge. That can enhance the computational efficiency and, and support focusing our computational resources in areas that matter most uh, within our models. And that can allow us to engage in, in um, uh, multi-scale modeling with crafting of different models at different levels of the system. So um, having provided that, that brief um, introduction, I'm, I'm going to dive into uh, the three vignettes, um, uh, bearing in mind the, the limitations of time here. Uh, the first vignette um, focuses on a combination of, of three of the different modeling techniques, um, agent-based modeling, system dynamics, and discrete event simulation. Um, this is work, uh, parts of which um, were, were conducted uh, uh, through the generosity of uh, the Health Quality Council on, on one of my doctoral students' um, time working there, um, uh, although the, the model uh, originated before has continued since then. Um, th this work, uh, centers uh, centers on the need to uh, anticipate um, uh, the uh, acute care capacity needs associated with the COVID nineteen pandemic in Saskatchewan, reflective of 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 uh, an understanding of, of really realistically how bad could it get within our province. Um, there's many aspects of this that I don't get into here, such as estimation of, of provincial uh, basic reproductive numbers, but do draw on the approaches um, uh, noted uh, in some of the later parts of this talk. Uh, the goal here is to support capacity planning estimates. And um, to do that, we, we made use of an age and sex structure, uh, age stratified model that describes COVID-19 transmission in Saskatchewan, but with a strong twist. The transmission module of this um, makes uh, central use of, of compartmental characterization for the vast bulk of the, the, the population that's susceptible. Um, but individuals um, uh, are uh, rendered into agents or are individuated um, uh, at, at a point of the risk continuum uh, presently when they uh, become infected. Um, and from that, they, they um, can be rendered into agents. So they, they are exposed to other agents using contact matrices and, um, and uh, mass action dynamics within the compartmental transmission model. Um, uh, but they can be rendered into agents um, uh, once they are infected, in, in which case they can infect other uh, individuals. They can flow in for care and they can be um, uh, discharged from care at a level of their particular characteristics and, and uh, heterogeneity. Uh, so this includes a, um, uh, a characterization of patient flow through the, through the system. Um, and a capacity to represent uh, different regions within our province or indeed within Canada more broadly. Um, this modeling makes use therefore of compartmental transmission, uh, excuse me, compartmental models or system dynamics models, uh, agent-based agent models, uh, but also discrete event simulation models to represent the service delivery uh, components of the system. The population um, mixing model um, is used for the uh, vast bulk of the population keeping um, uh, computational resource demands uh, comparatively low uh, compared to, say, a pure agent-based model, as will be featured next, excuse me, featured last. Um, individuals um, uh, start susceptible and, and can be exposed over time. Um, we, we have individuals that can progress um, persistently um, uh, in a symptomatic fashion. So uh, there's a oligosymptomatic pathway to reflect the, uh, the uh, growing uh, conviction among scientists that there are uh, many individuals um, who uh, persist in an asymptomatic fashion through their infectious period. Um, uh, other individuals progress in a more traditional um, uh, 
uh, natural history of infection becoming um, symptomatic, for example, um, uh, over time. Uh, individuals uh, who are susceptible uh, or exposed can be uh, isolated or quarantined, um, uh, resulting in their reduction of their mixing. Someone who's susceptible can be quarantined uh, presumptively, for, say following a contact trace, may be protected against subsequent infection. But these are the key pathways on the right-hand side here that, uh, that reflect uh, infection of an individual. Um, uh, an individual also becomes infected here. And so doing, they flow into a series of, um, uh, of workflows um, within discrete event simulation that lead them to be contact traced uh, where appropriate, that uh, allow them to progress and indeed allow them to enter acute care. Um, where different levels of, um, uh, of resource demand, including different types of ventilation, uh, are called for. Um, individuals uh, can um, be subject, are subject to mortality, but many survive and are, are discharged. Um, this representation supports uh, uh, capacitation in the form of explicit representation of resources, particularly key resources such as uh, acute care beds, ICU beds, um, more specifically, and, and ventilator supplies. Um, and uh, we do have a representation which is at an individual level, allowing for very fine-grained uh, uh, treatment of, of patients, capturing of different distributions for treatment as, as possible within this model. Um, the division of individuals um, is a uh, familiar one for those um, um, who are familiar with the with the literature, with some um, non oligos So there's oligosymptomatic individuals, um, many of which go uncaught except by active uh, tracing or active um, uh, case finding mechanisms like screening or contact tracing. Individuals uh, who are not oligosymptomatic, um, who do develop symptoms, can do so in mild, severe, or critical. Um, um, and some individuals, uh, particularly those uh, classified as critical, are, are subject to, uh, to death. There's some basic uh, assumptions about the uh, natural history of infection and, and timing associated with, um, with, with the flow here and the, um, uh, the level of resource demands and, and timing uh, within ICU and critically for that post-ICU um, uh, rehabilitation uh, period. Um, these uh, these delays um, or, or, or durations are of great importance in, in that they can uh, impose demand for acute care resources. It's not just uh, how many people come in right now, but how long they stay that often can lead to uh, um, bottlenecks that can lead to exceeding uh, demands. And the model is designed to capture that very well at an, at an individual level. Um, key outcome measures are not limited to, but, but do include the following, or outcome measures include the following, uh, acute care beds, ICU beds, and, and, and ventilators. Um, and um, while many of our analyses have been conducted over 180 days, uh, these days uh, many of them um, uh, look beyond that, reflective of the excellent job that our province uh, did early on in um, containing uh, the outbreak due to aggressive early action. Um, so um, why do we engage in hybrid modeling for this? Well, there, there's a number of reasons. Uh, comparative advantage. It's to, to represent resource uh, constraints um, and the, um, uh, the level of waiting for them or the length of time under which an individual uh, needs them. Um, uh, the, uh, the language of discrete event simulation is an exquisitely um, accurate one. To capture the, uh, the, the contact tracing process on, on individuals, it can be very advantageous to have an individual level representation of infectives. Um, and, um, and yet, uh, system dynamics can, um, methods can provide a, a classical and uh, very well refined and understood um, um, characterization of population mixing using um, uh, preference or contact matrices as are used here. We also have different analysis needs. There are different questions asked in different areas of the system. For example, in the acute care side, we may be interested in PPE use, and, and a finer grained rev level of representation is, is called for, is, is, um, is advantageous. Um, 
Another is adaptivity. Um, by representing these these three uh, methods together, um, we can easily change the boundaries. For example, perhaps we want um, not just uh, infectious agents, uh, rep uh, infectious individuals represented as agents, individuated upon flowing, um, reaching that level of the risk continuum. Perhaps we wish to to contain um, the delineate another difference in the risk continuum as motivating agency as motivating individuation, such as people going in for um, uh, being named as contacts um, or being a contact of an infective, in which case, when individuals are contacted by an infective, they could become an agent. We can shift the boundaries of this model in a nimble way to capture more detail, for example, a, a fine-grained individual level characterization of, of contact tracing if we wish to do so, if our learning pushes us in that direction or suggests it, motivates us. So adaptivity is a key motivator here for hybrid modeling. It's this ability to shift the locations of the boundaries as our sense of priorities evolve or needs for certain sub-communities. Um, uh, another one is computational efficiency. By, by having this model largely simulating um, the vast bulk of the population at any one time is susceptible, meaning um, that the model can run very, very quickly for scenario exploration. Um, and uh, at the same time, represents uh, with a requisite level of detail or focal interest in infectious individuals and their acute care uh, journey, as well as their public health handling. Uh, as a result, um, uh, we can get a best of both worlds, great computational efficiency and rich understanding of the key aspects of the system about which we have the greatest interest. So that's vignette one, a model that weaves together agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, and discrete event modeling. Um, I would note following discharge, uh, people um, stay represented as, as, as agents. Um, so there is all three types of modeling. Vignette two is going to focus on a rather different um, axis or characterization. It's a combination of dynamic modeling in the form of compartmental models with machine learning. Um, responsive to the time, I'll have to go very quickly here. Um, uh, but I would note um, our uh, uh, substantive uh, amount of resources um, on this topic, uh, which are available. Um, and uh, some of my web pages devoted just off my homepage devoted specifically to this issue of, of these combined models. Um, here we're uh, seeking to address um, uh, daily reporting needs, understanding of where things are going in the short term, um, and uh, understanding what the current situation is. Are we dealing uh, with a situation where there are likely many, many un yet undiagnosed infectives, perhaps uh, asymptomatic individuals or perhaps uh, individuals who, um, who have simply not been found despite being symptomatic? Um, uh, and uh, to, to, under to uh, investigate the impacts of, of interventions that, that may bend the curve in the weeks and months forward. These needs for constant adaptive replanning are acute in the dance phase of the outbreak into which our province is now hurdling. Um, and this model was, was designed uh, with that in mind. So rather than uh, a model sitting as a um, sort of a, 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 a static uh, representation of a discrete product, that's developed and then used, it's really turned into a service with ongoing refreshing of the model, um, estimation of the latent state, projection forward, estimation of the basic reproductive, excuse me, the um, effective reproductive number that obtains right now, and the ability to ask what if questions. You know, we look to, to models here um, with, with the same expectations we might provide to, uh, to the models that govern other aspects of our lives. Take a, a weather model. Um, uh, we may be using the most sophisticated weather model uh, yet extant in the world uh, to anticipate tomorrow's weather. But if it's doing so based on an understanding of weather patterns only as observed up to a month ago, and we're trying to anticipate tomorrow's weather, um, we're probably on a fool's errand, uh, particularly here in the Canadian prairies. Um, with weather forecasts, um, uh, of course, we, we would never, never engage in such... Uh, 
and such tomfoolery. We, we would make use of a model that's constantly regrounded with what's actually been observed so that the same model um, renders far, far, far more accurate projections for tomorrow and the next day, etc., because it's been regrounded with the latest evidence. Um, uh, so tomorrow, the forecast for tomorrow, granted for, for that same weather model grounded with today's data and data on, on the recent past, um, is going to be far more accurate than it if we had asked for tomorrow's weather um, uh, as of a month ago. Um, or to, to view it another way, just like GPS systems constantly correct for where we're at in giving the recommendation of, of where to turn next, etc., we expect the same for our models. We expect, if we're being given guidance for models in a what-if sort of way, to be given guidance that's current, that reflects not just what the model thought would be the case now, but what's actually been observed, um, that it's regrounding a model understanding of the current situation with what's actually been observed for the world, reflecting the fact that both are terribly fallible. Um, so to, to achieve this, we uh, have long turned to three primary strategies for combining machine learning on the one side and dynamic models on the other. And I list those strategies here. Uh, in each of them, we have publications in the peer-reviewed literature um, that can be readily found on Google Scholar or elsewhere. Um, but the one we're going to focus on today is the second one, particle filtering. And, and here, uh, we are seeking to, uh, to estimate the latent state of the model, or technically sample from it, um, um, in light of all the evidence till now. And in fact, uh, we're going to be sampling from trajectories, as we'll see, this x sub 1 colon t. For those who's, for whom that, that uh, notion is not off-putting, I'll also note that theta here is model parameters, m is the model. Uh, and why is the set of observations. We're trying to estimate what's going on right now out there in the population. And we do so in turn with a population of particles, which have these jockeying hypotheses competing to explain what's going on. This is a method which, um, uh, if you look at my publication record, we've used in many, uh, many other areas, uh, most of them provided here. And I need to credit my... Um, my longtime collaborator, Dr. Jushin Liu of the uh, Department of Math and Stats at University of Saskatchewan for her uh, foundational work and, and helping to shape this work and inform our understanding of the methods, how best they can be used, um, and our implementation of them. Um, so particle filtering um, is a deep process. And you'll find videos of me on YouTube uh, uh, holding forth on some of its more technical components for those interested in, in diving deeper. Um, there's uh, neither time um, nor uh, topical space for that here. Um, uh, but a few key for, uh, uh, facts for how it works. Basically, the model involved uh, has some stochastics, some, some uncertainty associated with it. In this case, it is a compartmental model, but there are some, some aspects of it that are evolving in an uncertain way. Um, and uh, this model, uh, during normal operation, it just runs. For each particle, it, 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 it runs forward um, in a normal way. But at observation points, the, the understanding of the model gets corrected. Um, so uh, within this context, when new data comes in, that data is taken into account, and we have an updated sense of what the current situation is, much as with a weather report, we might, um, by glancing at it, have an updated appreciation for for what's currently going on outside in our backyard. And it, this is done in a computational, quite frugal way um, that technically is called a recursive. Um, uh, it's incremental. Within this context, essentially we're running a compartmental model uh, in parallel for thousands in, in our case, we often use tens of thousands of particles. And, and each particle basically represents a different hypothesis about, at a given time, what's going on out there in the population right now. It is a complete sort of hypothesis about the current state of the system as represented in the model. And these hypotheses jockey to explain. They compete with one another to explain the empirical data. Um, and there's a survival of the fittest of them. 
the, the particles that posit a situation in the world that, that turns out to be more consistent with the data, um, given the implication of that state of the world for what we'd expect to see the data, those get rewarded. They get upweighted. So each particle is associated with a weight. And the particles that are more consistent get upweighted. Particles that are less consistent get downweighted. Um, and um, uh, these weights are used to to filter out particles that are uh, that are um, too low a weight that are just not responsive to the data, and um, allow particles that are to um, uh, to be fruitful and multiply. Um, so conceptually, if we have an anti-logic model, we're running it in parallel over tens of thousands of these particles, having them compete. Truth is, we do so sometimes for as few as hundreds of particles, but you get extra advantage for a larger number. So what this, a lot of fancy talk here. What, what does this really give you? Well, it gives you the ability, ladies and gentlemen, to have a model that's constantly regrounded with new evidence, and that allows you to take in that evidence into account and understanding what's going on in the external world, how many people out there, for example, might be infected, and we don't know it. Or uh, what's the effective reproductive number out there right now? How many people is an infective infecting before they recover? If that's greater than one, the bug is going to be spreading. If it's less than one, we're, we're controlling it by and large. And there might be little, you know, outbreaks here and there, but uh, by and large, we're, we're, we're bringing it under control. And there's going to be fewer infectives over time. Um, so it allows us to, give a, to get a sense, for example, for what's going on out there right now. But it also allows us to get a sense of where we might be going in the near future. So, for example, the, the incident cases that might be coming up or the hospitalizations that might be anticipated in the near future, um, uh, the ICU demands. Um, the model currently is, is more focused at the hospitalization level, but there's, there's near-term extensions anticipated for, for ICU, and, and the model structure has been characterized for that already. Um, in addition, a model like this, uh, th this method could be used to ask what if scenarios, but what if scenarios grounded by an understanding of, of where we are right now? For example, if there's comparatively uh, few um, uh, undiagnosed infectives and indeed diagnosed ones, we might be more comfortable relaxing certain types of interventions. Um, uh, if the number of, uh, the degree of mixing in the population is still estimated to be low, um, uh, we we might um, rest a bit satisfied, but if it's getting higher and higher, we might engage in public messaging. Um, so what if scenarios can be based looking forward to ask what if questions, given where we're probably at now, and it gives a probabilistic estimate, what's likely to be coming? How does this model do this? Well, it learns over time, ladies and gentlemen. It learns from observations about factors such as the number of cases um, broken down by, by travel status, um, uh, the number of persons tested, number of persons testing positive, deaths. So this totality of evidence involving those. And, and right now we're, we're, we're just getting access to age specific and regional specific data, and we'll soon be tapping hospitalization data and ICU use. And it uses all of this puts that together, data together into a consistent picture of what's likely going on uh, right now and what, what to be anticipated going forward. So there's a variety of, of, um, of different um, variants of this model, including for different Canadian provinces, Canada as a whole, and some international jurisdictions. Key particle filtering elements here um, include separating travel from non-travel diagnosed cases, um, the representation of persistent oligosymptomatic pathways, um, so a pathway of, of persistent asymptomatics. Um, uh, age and regional specific mixing is now possible due to the excellent work of uh, doctoral student Xiao Yan Li, um, who's, who's been a, a key, uh, the key leader um, through so much of our work involving particle filtering. Um, uh, Consideration of, of test volumes and positivity in the likelihood functions has been uh, achieved. And we have perimeter uncertainty captured with respect to evolving quantities, such as those related to presentation for symptoms, contact, and efficacy of, of testing. 
Um, and there's a simple representation of contact tracing and screening as well. Um, um, okay, so important elements. Um, this model ingests over time um, uh, data um, involving cases, travel related, uh, testing, and, and deaths. It has a a very good uh, behavior observed uh, for multi for many jurisdictions now, and it successfully detects shifts in the epidemiology over time. Um, it also allows for ready estimates of the current uh, state of the system and, and projecting forward and allowing us to examine interventions. One of the more interesting components is it allows uh, backcasting. Um, this is due to Xiao Yan's excellent work on um, leveraging ancestry matrices. Um, from the uh, particle MCMC literature to allow us to engage in sampling, not just cross-sectionally at a given time, what the state of the model is, but sampling of trajectories over time, um, which allows us to essentially take, consider later data and model dynamics to, to infer what was likely the case earlier. For example, case in point, what was the, late, uh, the, the likely effective reproductive number before interventions began, which gives us a clue to the basic reproductive number. What do you get out of here is sort of a, it could be thought of as population tomography. Um, some people watching this video, many likely, will be um, familiar with the idea of a um, uh, of uh, CAT scans or um, magnetic uh, resonance imaging, MRIs. Um, the strength of these methods, um, uh, lies not in the, the the tremendous accuracy of any one image that they produce. Um, uh, a CAT scan, for example, um, image from a given angle will be taken from a given angle, and it will be, you know, it of shadows cast by uh, bones or stents or or, or um, you know metal plates. Um, it will have a limited field of view. Um, uh, certain aspects of it uh, will be uh, blurry because of different um, focal um, considerations. Um, but the real power is not, not the particular accuracy of any one image, but putting all those images together, each of which is terribly flawed, but together they illuminate a 3D view of what's going on within the patient's body. And so it is, ladies and gentlemen, with particle filtering and dynamic models. By knitting together many lines of evidence here, uh, many lines of evidence, um, with uh, an underlying theory of the, of the model as captured through um, uh, the, the underlying model equations. Here, compartmental models and some other work we're doing agent-based models. Um, we can get sort of a, a 3D view of what's going on in the system that knits together all that evidence and all that theory into a consistent picture, a probabilistic picture, but one which evolves over time as new evidence emerges. So here we're observing from evidence over time um, and using that evidence to, to allow us to arrive at deductions. For example, um, and this is a, a 2D histogram in, in any logic. We have time running on the x-axis. Um, and on the y-axis is shown effective reproductive number. Um, this is a 2D histogram. So at a given time, we could say, say where the dotted line is. We could think of this as slicing through a... Um, a uh, this 2D histogram, and you could fo if you follow that line, it will be a a, a, a distribution along that line, indicating uh, what the likely uh, effective reproductive number was at time. In this case, it's around time 52. Um, so this is telling us probably it's closer to 0.8, but it could be as high as as one up here. Um, this is of great interest to our authorities because if it's greater than one. Um, we're in trouble. The, the outbreak will likely be spreading. And so on a daily basis, these are recomputed. Um, soon we'll be doing this for provinces across uh, Canada to provide them an understanding of how close we are to that knife edge, where things might be taking off, et cetera. Um, we can also get, and it's part of this 3D view, an understanding of the the underlying count of undiagnosed infectives that are likely out there. This is aspects of the latent state of the system estimated by the particle filter. Or something about the number of people, the fraction of cases that are likely engaging in care-seeking right now. 
in short, we can probe probabilistically some understanding of what's likely the case at there. And it's actually a, a joint distribution over the state of the model. Um, and uh, this provides us a, a very powerful way of, of understanding the current context, but can then apply the basis for looking for and understanding where are things probably going within the next week or two, um, given what we've uh, seen to this point. A very important component that I referenced earlier is backcasting. So this is this consists of estimating earlier state in light of in light of the later dynamics and the in light of later uh, evidence seen um, to the current point. Um, so particle filtering is, is commonly used to cross-sectionally estimate, given all the data, say for time 30 here, given all the data we've seen to time 30, what's our effective understanding, for example, of, of the number of infectives out there, or in this case, how many cases of new infection we'd expect to see. Um, uh, and uh, in this case, um, we actually get a number uh, purple, which is below what, what we would have anticipated with the model. And the model corrects for that. And it does better in subsequent days here, say, um, um, for, for quite a long time. Uh, it does quite a lot better. It gets corrected. The point is that um, we are uh, uh, estimating this distribution, say, at time 30, in light of all the evidence coming before. But if we consider the evidence subsequent to that, how things actually went later, it probably tells us something about what was going on there at time 30. After all, if we had a big outbreak following time 30, it clues us into the fact that there's probably quite a lot of susceptibles and quite a lot of, uh, at least a, a small number of infectives to get that outbreak started at that time. Um, by contrast, if it were totally quiescent, um, there were no new cases for, for weeks, it probably tells us you know, if there were any infectives, they were very, very s small number, and um, uh, it's it suggests that um, the state a, re a different interpretation of the state. Alternatively, you could suggest that the about the number of recoveries. Um, that's a very traditional way of using particle filtering. Well, what backcasting allows us, uh, well, so backcasting allows us to use that later information to understanding to understand what uh, was the case earlier. And to do this, there's a mechanism of using uh, ancestry matrices, and we sample from trajectories. Um, till now, uh, each trajectory posits a specific dynamics over time. And, um, and by sampling these trajectories from the latest time, we can sort of infer what was the case earlier consistent with latest evidence. So that allows us, for example, to go back and estimate the effective reproductive number going back in a way that takes into account all the subsequent data and dynamics which have been observed. Where these techniques are most uh, effective, of course, is where they're combined with streaming incoming data, data that's always current, that evidences the model on a constant basis and allows the model to rerun. And my absolutely extraordinary master student, uh, Lu Jie Duan, has uh, taken the lead in, in hitching up these streaming mechanisms um, for our particle MCMC, uh, as well as our particle filtering models. And doing so, for example, with any logic agent-based particle filter models, when new data comes in, whether it's uh, web scrape data from websites, uh, database data, or data collecting interface from smartphones, et cetera, uh, such as our Ethica uh, uh, epidemiological data collection system, um, uh, that model can come in. Um, it can be uh, uh, it can be routed around. Um, it can be archived. Uh, it can um, be routed to particular models, and the models get automatically updated to the latest uh, situation. And they can be used to uh, to ask what if questions or project forward. Um, uh, Luce has has undertaken this work. Um, to support automated particle filtering and particle MCMC um, using the methods uh, of the sort described here. Um, uh, Luce has also extraordinarily accelerated uh, many of those methods, such as for particle MCMC, for many models by dozens of times uh, using uh, GPUs, graphical processing units, to allow the models to, to run uh, far quicker. And what that turns into means 
that we conduct uh, can conduct um, analyses, for example, with particle on CMC in a day that would other take, otherwise take the better part of a month or even over a month. Or alternatively, within a day, we can conduct much richer analysis, time box by a day, than would have been possible um, without this acceleration. Uh, Lugiev, through his extraordinary efforts, whether with any logic models or part particle and CMC models, with the streaming has been a key component of this infrastructure to allow us to aut create automated reports on a daily basis uh, for, for partners, which is uh, um, an infrastructure shortly to be launched for partners across Canada, as well as for our provincial healthcare system. So daily reporting, daily updates, to keep the models abreast of the latest evidence. So the motivations for hybrid modeling in this case predominantly um, uh, were, were um, uh, focused on comparative advantages of, of each approach, uh, machine learning versus dynamic modeling, each complementing the other in extraordinary ways, um, and different analysis needs across the models. Machine learning, um, the inferencing, um, supports uh, Estimation methods, um, the dynamic modeling supports projection and what if questions, counterfactual questions associated with those, um, and um, can do so in a way that, that each speaks to the strength of the other. Finally, I'm going to be speaking about um, the third vignette. This vignette, um, uh, again, combines uh, two types of dynamic modeling, agent-based modeling on the one hand, discrete event simulation, for detailed evaluation of, of um, uh, intervention portfolios. That says evaluation portfolios. Apologies, intervention portfolios. So here we are combining agent-based modeling and discrete event simulation. Um, this is a GIS-enabled ABM with a particular eye towards uh, informing stakeholder understanding, um, uh, including resource placement questions. Um, as well as our ability to characterize uh, remote and, uh, uh, and rural regions within our province and smaller communities, each of which having their own geographic context germane to intervention selection, such as um, uh, uh, community quarantining measures in our First Nations communities. Um, this model supports um, and is supported by a wide variety of agent types. Um, there's agents for uh, persons, for, uh, uh, for those involved in uh, screening and, 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 and conducting the lab tests associated with, uh, with processing uh, the results of, of uh, tests, say, for example, with uh, PCR swabbing. Um, for representation of long-term care facilities as agents, uh, laboratories, community cohort facilities, contact tracing. Um, operations, so tracing individuals within their networks to track down who may have spread to them or, or who may have been infected by them, um, for characterizing the operation of larger acute care facilities such as hospitals and, and long-term care facilities. It further involves um, uh, a, a set of, of more passive agents that are still still play an important role in the household, such as for mediating transmission, such as representing of workplaces, which may be closed or open, um, according to social distancing guidelines, uh, households, um, uh, schools. Um, we also represent, for more technical reasons, test specimens and, and tracing records. So individuals within this uh, model mix within households, schools, workplaces, and long-term care facilities. Um, uh, and also in hospitals. Individuals can become infected in any of those, including through nosocomial infection in hospitals and long-term care facilities. So there can be uh, uh, spread of infection, for example, to healthcare workers or spread of infection to residents from a healthcare worker in a long-term care facility. Um, uh, this model is grounded by a set of data, some of which uh, lies within our province, the source of which others lie outside of our province. And a central motivating factor, and indeed a rich source of insight provided by this model, relates to a broad set of fine-grained public health interventions, which it has been crafted to examine, whose trade-offs it has been crafted to examine. Um, this includes many of the factors here. 
They are factors related to the impact of community cohorting, putting infectious people together in a, in a single facility, contact tracing processes, um, and mass and targeted screening. But also um, understanding um, the, uh, the impacts of school closures or, and, and workplace closures. Um, uh, changes in in-community mixing compared to, to mixing that takes place, say, in workplaces, being able to examine that in a fine-grained way, where the, the mixing is taking place, reflective of the fact that different intervention portfolios may influence them differently, and different messaging strategies, the same. Um, we examine uh, scenarios involving staggered rollback, for example, of workplace uh, closures or physical distancing measures over time. We further have extensively looked at PPE use, um, uh, and it's, I, sh I should say we've looked at, I, I can't say we've extensively, um, but it's been looked at from the perspective of uh, hospitals, community cohort facilities, um, but also in long-term care. And in long-term care, I want to highlight, um, uh, this has been the first of our forays into more uh, fine-grained representation of certain at-risk populations. So here we represent not just a blunt uh, uh, screening of all, but differentially resident screening versus staff screening and closing facilities to visitors, restricting um, staff sharing uh, between facilities to, to limit the degree to which uh, uh, a bug can spread through staff cohorting. Um, and then also PPE use um, that we examine. Um, and finally, in conjunction with uh, Alex Doroshenko and Karsten Hempel, um, whose work also uh, joint with us uh, also helped to inspire some of the, the thoughts about model representation, uh, representation of household sizes, et cetera. Um, uh, we, we represent um, uh, the impacts of masks. Uh, individuals within this model make use of a natural history of infection, um, uh, similar to uh, seen in some of those other models, including the possibility of persistent oligosymptomatic individuals. We also represent as a possibility the loss of, of um, uh, persistent immunity. Um, but uh, progression in terms of um, uh, status of infection is just one part of this, um, uh, of this progression. Uh, additional agent behaviors uh, relate to, for example, their diagnosis status. Um, uh, their, uh, their care needs and uh, whether it, um, it motivates uh, requirements for uh, a ventilator, for example, an acute care bed. Um, uh, we, we represent, for example, whether they're isolated in a community cohort or under staff isolation, uh, whether they're seeking care or, or not currently seeking care. Um, this model, um, in contrast to some that we've built, has only a rather uh, simple characterization of hospitals, um, uh, characterization that um, still is fairly articulated by the standards, certainly of compartmental or agent-based models, um, in that it captures a structured workflow um, that involves a number of, of checkpoints and considerations, for example, as to uh, the level of acuity of a parent uh, of a patient, et cetera. And there are uh, capacitation um, limits provided for the resources involved. Um, uh, I, I will note that um, within these facilities, infection can spread. Currently, um, it's a limitation of this model that we're not currently reflecting those in capacity uh, changes. Um, it, for example, uh, reducing the capacity reflected the fact that two out of 10 Emergency room physicians have been um, um, exposed to COVID and, and have to isolate. Um, but it is a, uh, a significant um, uh, opportunity to do so very quickly because they are represented there. Uh, beyond the hospital, contact tracing as a process is represented. So we, we captured in a finer grained way the, the process of, of finding individuals and, and getting them tested and waiting their, for their test results, um, et cetera. It is notable that in as much as we're seeking to characterize diverse communities, such as those in our far north, um, some of the aspects of this process may be very different in their timing. And the capacity of a GIS-based model, and one of its strengths, um, speaks well to this, uh, that we can characterize, for example, for a small remote community, the unique delays associated with flying out samples for testing. Um, and alternatively, for another scenario, examine the impacts of, 
of local kits that would allow that testing to be done, perhaps with different sensitivity specificity trade-offs uh, locally. Um, healthcare elements, we do represent healthcare seeking. Um, I mentioned nosocomial transmission, PPE use at different levels, um, and uh, delays uh, and, and, and testing that are, that are associated with it. Um, uh, lab testing um, uh, has a limited capacity or can be made uh, essentially unlimited if, if desired to separate that out from, from uh, simulations. Um, there are endogenous uh, lab delays based on the, the volumes and the delays impact diagnosis and reporting. So a model like this can be used. Um, these are not uh, latest results and they should not be taken as, as the results of the model by any means, but I, I include them in here to provide some you know, example of the types of things that a model could be used to produce. But um, for example, we could simulate dozens of different intervention portfolios and assess their impact, for example, on, on, on infections that take place, whether median, mean, uh, et cetera. Um, and examine the trade-offs between inter interventions as we relax certain measures, such as um, schools coming back into session or workplaces, and see to what degree interventions put in place fixes that stay fixed despite those relaxations, or to what degree their gains are subject to loss following the relaxation. We can examine this from the same model. These are just different summaries, different lenses being used on its outputs over time, um, representing, for example, many outcome measures in response to a baseline scenario and to an intervention scenario, which might posit certain types of uh, relaxation of interventions. Again, these outputs are, are morally, more, merely illustrative. They should be, not be taken as, as uh, indications of, of uh, what is anticipated, nor um, uh, our latest results for, for our province at all. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, uh, a big uh, point of focus right now is representing key vulnerable populations. These include uh, the homeless population, those uh, related, those with mental health and addictions challenges. They have some overlap, but by no means in light of today's traumatic economic environment, um, are, by no means are they um, mutually exclusive, um, nor are they, uh, excuse me, nor are they um, uh, entirely overlapped. Uh, incarcerated individuals, we've had some good reach out from our Ministry of Corrections and Policing, which uh, with which we are eager to, to uh, push forward some work uh, in Indigenous communities. Again, having uh, been grateful for some reach out there, um, but with the conviction that it needs to be undertaken in a partnership capacity. Um, for elderly and, and, um, and aged care, we have a particular uh, commitment as well that's reflected in long-term care, but we are proceeding towards representation of personal care homes and uh, assisted care communities as well. Um, and then the unique context of remote communities, which, um, uh, uh, in, which include, but are not limited to many indigenous communities. And finally, healthcare workers. Within the northern context, uh, much of our interest lies on the housing front. Housing is a pervasive impact, social determinant of health. As my colleague Corey Newdorf has long emphasized, the impact of housing ramifies across an individual's uh, uh, trajectory um, and indeed often across their lifespan. Um, uh, the impacts of crowding can impact transmission, to be sure, but also their capacity to isolate if, if found to be positive, physical distancing guidelines, um, the air quality to which they are subject. Um, if an individual lives with, with 15 under, other individuals, several of whom are smokers, um, it almost dooms them, particularly in a context of our northern communities where ventilation is often quite limited. Uh, and the housing stock uh, is poor enough to, to not allow that to be uh, uh, to really be uh, very effective. The air quality can be really adverse in a way that could very materially increase the risks of, of COVID. Chronic disease um, and air travel requirements uh, slow things, uh, close things down. Chronic disease is uh, potent risk factors. Um, and the need for air travel can slow down testing, um, uh, receiving back uh, test results, um, uh, limit the ability for contact tracers to come into town, can require um, uh, long delays associated with getting an individual to the requisite acute care um, uh, at a tertiary hospital. 
Um, it can also, um, factors here can, can also, though, play into the potential for different types of interventions. For example, community-wide isolation may become possible for many remote communities, um, and community cohorting in a context of crowding seems particularly important. So hybrid modeling in this case has been used to secure uh, many advantages. Comparative advantage of different met methods and different areas, such as the the exquisite ability for discrete event simulation to capture uh, the, um, the the resource requirements um, and the slowdowns associated with differential levels of resourcing, uh, different analysis needs across different parts of the model um, to allow the model to evolve in a nimble fashion and to speak with stakeholders, particularly through the use, for example, of GIS uh, type methods. So a few take home messages. Diverse types of hybrid models um, can offer great value in planning for uh, preventing and controlling COVID-19. Uh, different models are, are built for different purposes and it behooves us to build a different model, for example, for um, for allowing us to estimate the current effective reproductive number and engage in short-term projection and uh, what-if scenarios probabilistically than for detailed intervention selection or indeed for uh, the type of quick model that needs to be assembled for capacity planning. Um, interweaving of different types of modeling methods allows for these models that are at once transparent. They use the right mechanism for the right parts of the model. Um, and mechanisms to speak to stakeholders uh, for that area of the system. They are performant, such as with the capacity planning model and representing most of the population, the vast majority of, of a population who remain susceptible um, in, a, in a stock, in a, in a, um, a compartment context. Um, they are scalable. Uh, they can be more, th those models can be more scalable. They can be highly effective at answering the questions for which they're designed. And indeed, they afford us a nimbleness and agility, which is much needed in this fast moving pandemic. Um, these methods are, are moreover synergistic with large scale data collection, uh, such as high velocity uh, versions of, of traditional uh, types of data, for example, testing and case information and data from acute care, but also novel. And I, I want to highlight our, our um, a keen interest in, in getting, as for many past uh, models, are smartphone-based um, uh, types of, of uh, uh, data collection uh, hitched up, whether it's uh, more research-based data collection associated with changes in contact patterns and mobility over time, or uh, contact tracing. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, being able to tap in social media and uh, call, call volumes for helplines. Um, uh, those uh, who are interested uh, in additional understanding on the hybrid model front may want to check out this uh, URL as well. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been my uh, great pleasure to be with you here for the past hour. I hope that work gives you a bit of a glimpse of the um, breadth and richness and depth of, of methods that we have uh, used here to this point to confront the terrible challenge and scourge of uh, COVID-19 within the Canadian context. It is my sincere hope that some of this information might um, help uh, support uh, work elsewhere um, uh, to confront this, uh, this modern day uh, plague and allow us to proceed uh, at once with uh, policy portfolios um, uh, that uh, add life to our years, but also years to our life. Thank you very much uh, for the honor of presenting, and I look forward uh, to uh, taking uh, questions in the upcoming panel session. I would welcome any uh, reach outs for those interested in learning from or adapting elements of the types of models um, undertaken here. And I want to provide once again, my most sincere thanks to all those who made this work possible, uh, including uh, Jenny Basran at the Saskatchewan Health Authority, uh, the Ministry of Health and elsewhere at the Health Authority um, and the work of the extraordinary set of Cephal students um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Kurt Kruger, who have participated so centrally within this work. Thank you very much.